Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York-based jazz guitarist, composer, and arranger, Peter Hand. He opened up about his latest 2019 CD called Hand Painted Dream he did with his big band. The album is a culmination of his work with some of the best musicians anywhere in the world, like Camille Thurman and Houston Person. This New York City native took classical piano lessons as a child before switching to guitar in his early teens. In the beginning, the sounds of B.B. King and Albert King allured him. He would go on to become a pre-med student, but he left that behind for the music, a decision that he never regretted. He's got great stories, so please get to know Peter and dig this interview, my friends. So, Peter, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today, man. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, and you have a great blog and radio programming as well. It's a pleasure. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Let's go ahead and dive right in to your latest 2019 CD with your big band, Hand Painted Dream. Talk to me about the vision, the the desire that you had with this project. Sure. Well, I've been writing and arranging for a long time, so the desire is always there. And I've been lucky that this is actually my third big band album. The first one was a live recording with a Houston person as a special guest artist, and we did original arrangements of music of Harold Arlen. We did a second album, which is more like the third one in that it's a studio recording and a mix of originals and standards. Houston person was a guest on three tracks there. And then with the new album, that was developed a little bit further because I wanted to have more of a mix of new arrangements of songs and standards and original music, plus I was so lucky to have such incredible musicians on all the albums, including the new one. Camille Thurman was a guest vocalist on this new album and playing tenor sax, and there was a string quartet augmenting the band on one selection as well. So I tried my best to have a lot of variety of different types of grooves and feels, and that was inspiring me in this recording. So it has to be so much easier when you get these professional musicians that have been around for a long time and they come in, how easy is it? How pleasurable is it to have that happen? Well, once you have the work done and you can assemble these musicians and you see that they're enthusiastic, you kind of lose yourself in just going about the business in the recording studio and rehearsals and try to get the music to really come alive. And as you were saying, to have such amazing professionals, it's a dream come true for a writer or a performer as well to play. So they make it easy because they know exactly what to do and you can get into the nuances. Plus, they give you a lot of suggestions that you wouldn't even think of, even little things here and there with dynamics or how a certain uh, solely section might be interpreted differently. So it's an ongoing process and I am so thrilled to be working with some of them. You know, a lot of jazz players around the world always dream of getting to New York and you were born there and this has been your home. Talk to me a little bit about growing up in New York and how you really got involved with jazz. I know you started in piano early on. Just kind of give me an idea. Well, thanks. That's a great question. And yes, I did grow up in New York City. And in the 1960s, it was an incredible time as a teenager going to middle school and high school because music was everywhere. So I loved all kinds of music. There was Broadway, there was jazz, popular music, classical music, and Things didn't cost a fortune to go to, and Subway made it easy to go anywhere to hear music. So I switched to guitar as a teenager, and I fell in love in particular with blues music. And I started to teach myself and had some lessons, the guitar work of D.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, and just uh, all of those musicians, Buddy Guy. Then I went to... um, Binghamton University, where I started my own bands there, and I was a pre-med student, but the urge to do music was so strong, I went back to the city. I left Binghamton in my third year, and for a couple of years, I had my own bands and played in some other groups, but I was getting more interested in jazz. I was aware of jazz, of course, because it was everywhere, but I wanted to get a formal education, and I was getting very interested in horn arrangements that I heard in Uh, all the um, arrangements everywhere. And in particular, uh, I liked uh, arrangements of Oliver Nelson and Dave Matthews, who was an arranger for James Brown. So in any case, I went to Berklee College of Music. I started as an instrumental major. It was really funny because I didn't play any jazz when I went there. 
So I had my first meeting with the guitar instructor the first week, and he says, play something for me. So I don't remember exactly what I played. So he said to me, you sound like Grant Green. I said, who's Grant Green? So it was after that that I went completely into studying and loving the music of all the jazz greats, and then studied arranging and composing with some incredible instructors with the idea that I wanted to put my own band together sometime. And that led to several phases where I moved to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands with small groups. But it was a great training ground because as a vacation area, there's so much work. Moving back to New York, I had a nine-piece band and then uh, studied some more with the BMI Jazz Composers Workshop. So I guess I went on a little too long after growing up in New York City. But getting back to that, that was a very wonderful time to just have so much music everywhere. No, that's great, and I love it that, that the tangent went because that's going to lead into this. My question to you is this. You went into school for pre-med, and the one thing about musicians is that I know that arranging and composing comes into it, but I'm kind of looking at your whole creative ed. Do you think there was a part of you in that pre-med mindset that really branched out from just playing an instrument to wanting to compose and arrange? I think so in the sense that it involves a lot of concentration, and there's a lot of math in music, not that it's a science, but it's an art form where counting and numbers and form and architectural structure, which involves math, they're all very important. So that might have something to do with it. But as far as medicine, I don't regret uh, not pursuing that because I don't really like the sight of blood and I would much rather be involved in the arts. So at Berkeley, you really got involved with Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Cole Schrein, kind of that bebop. Uh, momentum. What, where, where do you lean? What really gets you going when you sit back and listen to jazz? Well, it's interesting. I'm very eclectic because I love the music from the 40s on, uh, all of the bebop, hard bop, uh, modal, Coltrane, Miles, Latin, Brazilian. It's hard to pick anything in particular. Uh, anything that really moves me just moves me tremendously for what it is. In more recent years, I've had a chance to listen to some older music in the 30s and early 40s, and that's fantastic in a different way. So I can't really pinpoint anything, but if I had to, I would say it all really starts for me with Bird, Kansas City. Very nice. So you've been able to play with some veterans and stars of the jazz world, like the Conan, George Coleman, lots of names. What do you learn from these professionals? It's kind of like on this album when you've been around Houston and you get to see these professionals, and, and you either get it by osmosis or by things they say. What did you get from these people? Well, I got from all of them and also from my mentor and good friend, Houston Person, that you really have to be prepared and try to be in the moment. You have to spend a lot of time preparing your music and practicing, and then when you're actually performing or even in rehearsal, you have to be in the moment, and what you've practiced, you don't really think about it that much, especially with improvisation. But the more that you play and work to better yourself, the better it's going to turn out when you're actually performing. And another thing is professional demeanor. You want to be uh, simple things like being on time and having uh, your appearance okay and uh, not uh, trying to... Well, in other words, not uh, making a problem for your employer or anything like that. But musically, you really have to know your stuff. But listen, of course. I think everyone is aware that when you're playing, since it's in the moment, even if you're playing a melody of a song as a melody player or if you're comping, it's really about listening once you've done your homework and you've really practiced at home. In 2019, how do you think jazz is doing in America? I think it's a mixed bag. It's not very well in the public's eye, but there's so much jazz, there's so many recordings and musicians that really want to do it. And the education in uh, schools and uh, even middle school, high school, university level, that's where there's a lot of jazz. Uh, students want to play in the orchestras. And uh, radio is a great help as well and all the international touring and festivals. But it's still not that recognized and it's a constant fight to keep the level of recognition that it's at now. And then the recording industry has kind of collapsed, so it makes it even harder for musicians to 
try and continue what they're doing, but they do it because they want to do it. No matter what happens with recording or royalties, they're still going to do what they love. So at this point in your career, are you happy with where you're at? Yes, I am, Joe. I really am, and I think that I'm very grateful to the musicians and the recording company I'm with to have this uh, music out, and it can bring forth some more opportunities, and I'm going to be working even more, doing writing and playing. So early on, very, very early on in your life, what was one of the first jazz shows you saw and you thought, man, that's what I want to do? Well, I think that was once I was at um, Binghamton in my first year, I had actually uh, been going to blues concerts in New York City. So this is my first year at Binghamton University. The Modern Jazz Quartet came up and did a concert, and I thought it was amazing. And then at the same time, there were some jazz musician students at school and a wonderful director, Al Hom, of a jazz program there just starting. So that must have been the first concert. And then, of course, I got into the... Um, jazz guitarists that were very blues-oriented, Kenny Burrell, Wes Montgomery, later Grant Green. So I would say it was something along that. But when I got to Berkeley, from the first week I was hearing in some of the classes a uh, history of jazz, and everything spoke to me. Uh, they played a cut by Charlie Parker, Funky Blues, and I thought, this is unbelievable. It's, it's blues, and it's more, too. So why do you love jazz? Music has always been an amazing experience for me, and jazz and blues are beautiful. They have incredible musical form, melody, harmony, and passion. And I love other forms of music as well. But once I started playing guitar and tried to learn how to do the music I really liked, it led me to discover all these artists, all these recordings, and one thing was better than the next. So everyone has a perception or their version of who they think you are, your family, friends, students, mm -hmm. fans. So you know yourself best. Who do you think you are? Well, I think in terms of the quality of my music, that's not for me to judge. I'm happy with what I do. I'm very happy in my personal life and musical life. I also do teaching. And you've got to look forward to what you can do in days and months, weeks, and future to come. So... I feel pretty good about all of it. Right on. Peter, hey, thank you for taking the time out for Neon Jazz. Good luck with the album, and hopefully, man, we'll see you swing through the town of Bird here. That's great, and that just reminded me one quick thing to mention is that uh, on one of the albums that I did an arrangement for, it's actually with the Kansas City Jazz Orchestra live at the Plaza, when Houston Person was a guest artist with them, and he played one of the arrangements he had been playing with a big band that I had done on A Sunday Kind of Love. This was when Jim Mayer was the artistic director. Thank, Thank you. you. Keep it all up. It's great. You bet. Thank you, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Peter for his time, music, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.